Hi, I'm Dan and I work at Fanatic Bike. We're known for helping people create gorgeous custom builds with some of the best mountain bike brands on the planet. We've separated all the parts of a mountain bike into six different systems, which we're gonna break down in this series. With a good understanding of how all these components come together, you'll be able to confidently configure your own dream build. So stay tuned and join us in understanding mountain bikes. I've been looking forward to this episode, episode three, because we're gonna cover what is arguably one of the most important component systems on your bicycle. What am I talking about? Well, your wheels, and then of course your tires. Mountain bike wheel wheels are special because they have to handle all sorts of forces and stresses coming at them from every angle. And they also have to be light enough that we can bring them up to speed easily with just our legs. Many of the wheels we build here at Fnatic weigh in at four pounds total. That's for both the front and wheel, rear wheels combined. Mountain bike tires are in a similar boat because they have to not only be able to deal with us hacking our way through a sharp rocky trail or casing a big jump, but they also have to again be lightweight and stay clinched securely in our rim and contain a bunch of compressed air. Now, before I dive into why wheels are so friggin' cool, let's quickly name all of our components. First off, you've got your hub. Now, we've seen these before. You can see here the hub driver, which is the part of the hub that the cassette attaches to. It's this black piece here at the end. Next up, we have our spokes, 32 per wheel, although that can vary. Following that, we have our spoke nipple, which is what the spoke threads into, and a little nipple washer, which the nipple sits in and helps distribute that force on the rim. And lastly, the rim. Now into our rim, we will typically install a valve stem to get air into the tire, as well as rim tape to cover up all the spoke holes. Last but not least, the tire itself. Now, bicycle wheels are different than what you'll find on your car, a skateboard, or most other wheeled vehicles, and that's because they rely on a tensioned spoke to keep us suspended off the ground. Spokes are the key to what allow us to make a bicycle wheel so strong and so incredibly light. How does this work? Well, if you've ever handled a spoke, you're aware of how flimsy they are, how easy it is to bend and push on them. They are in fact just a piece of stainless steel wire that has been modified with threads on one end and this little J-bend hook at the other end. They get their strength when you pull on them, when you add pulling force or tension, it's called. Now, the mechanic does this as he builds up the wheel, he or she, by threading in these nipples a little bit, one at a time, around the entire wheel. This creates a situation where the spokes are all working under the condition that they're under tension, therefore really, really strong, and the wheel is able to disperse any forces that it receives, whether that's a compression force from a rock hitting it, or a twisting force from you turning your handlebars, and distribute them throughout the entire wheel, giving us our incredibly strong and incredibly light wheels on our bicycles. Now, a wheel that has the correct tension applied to all of its spokes is a strong wheel. It's a wheel where the spokes, any spoke never is under so much compression that it overcomes the tension that the spokes are already under. It's a wheel where the spokes are all allowed to work under conditions where they're really, really strong instead of really, really weak. That's the quick and dirty of what's going on in a bicycle wheel. There's a lot of physics that goes into making the right wheel for the job. Even things like whether you're making a front wheel or a rear wheel can affect how you lace up the spokes and how you build the wheel. That's because things like whether you're using a rim brake or a disc brake, whether the wheel is dealing with pedaling forces or not, all change how the forces are distributed. I'd like to talk about it more maybe in a future video, maybe get one of our wheel builders in here to tell us about it. But for now, let's move on to tires. Tires play a massive role in determining what our connection to the ground feels like, so they're a really important part of our mountain biking puzzle. These days, most mountain bikers ditch the inner tube and opt to run their wheels tubeless. This is pretty simple, but it can be pretty frustrating to do, especially if you don't have the right tools. 
essentially all we're doing is covering up those spoke holes that we saw on our rim with some tubeless rim tape, inserting a valve stem so we can get air into the system, and putting some sealant into our tire before we mount it all up. What this does, aside from saving a little weight by getting rid of that inner tube, is to really prevent us from getting pinch flats. That's where when you whack a rock or something hard and compress the tire down onto the hard rim, you're poking a hole in that fragile inner tube. That's not something that is that you can do with a tubeless setup. You can, of course, still tear your tire, but these are pretty burly, which is something we'll talk about here in a moment. Actually choosing the right tire for your bike can be a little overwhelming. Between all the different makes and models out there and all the little acronyms the companies use to describe them, it gets pretty overwhelming. So, to kind of simplify things, I'm going to take what is probably our most popular tire of all time, the Maxxis Minion DHF, and break down what these little acronyms and different marketing names mean, which sort of comes down to three different variables. So once you have an understanding of what to look for and can go on the company's website and determine what they're talking about, you'll be in a really good spot to browse through it all and kind of figure out what you're really looking for. Let's check that out. The first thing you'll want to look at is width. Here, for example, you'll see I have a 29 by 2.3 inch tire, 29 by 2.5 DHF, same tire, and a 29 by 2.5 wide trail tire. Now, 2.3, 2.5, that refers to inches and is the width of the tire when mounted up to your average width rim. 2.3 inches here, 2.5 inches here. What does WT mean? Well, you wouldn't know that unless you went onto Maxxis's website and read what it stood for, but it refers to wide trail. In this case, that simply means that Maxxis saw the increase, the prevalence of very wide rims and found that the profile of their regular 2.5 wasn't quite what they wanted on these extra wide rims. So they designed a slightly different tread pattern to accommodate that 2.5 WT. The next thing to take a look at is tire compound. Here I have a dual compound DHF. Here I have something that's called 3C Max Terra. And then lastly, something called 3C Max Grip. What does that all mean? Again, it's worth going to the given manufacturer's website and reading into it. But here we have a tire that uses two different rubber compounds. So it'll likely be a little bit harder. It'll likely be a little less expensive and it might be a good option for your rear tire. A 3C or 3 compound tire is gonna use three different compounds. In this case, they've designed it as sort of a medium wearing tire with maybe a little more grip than your dual compound one. And for max grip situations, this one fortunately is pretty intuitive. You have your max grip compound. Again, each brand will have different names for all this stuff, so check out their website. The last thing to take a look at is the tire casing. Now, lighter tire casings, obviously way less, but they are less puncture resistant and the tire isn't as sturdy. Heavier tire casings, way more, but they are suitable for more aggressive riding conditions and conditions where you have sharp rocks and are maybe racing and don't want to flat no matter what. Maxxis uses three primary ones. You'll see EXO protection here. XO Plus, which you have listed here, and Double Down. Now, these are primarily referring to the threads per inch, that's TPI, and on the back you'll see that this is 60 threads per inch on the XO versus six, or 120 on the XO Plus. So that's a tighter weave on the threads inside this rubber, again, making it tougher and a little sturdier and harder to rip. On the Double Down and then also downhill casings, you'll see that 120 TPI threads per inch casing, an extra butyl layer in there to help prevent rock strikes and things like that. And you get a tire that, although is quite a bit heavier, is also sturdier and won't roll as much in sharp or hard cornering situations. And it's just gonna stand up better to harder riding. That covers wheels and tires, part three of understanding mountain bikes. 
with an understanding of how a tension spoke wheel works. I hope you have an appreciation for what a wonder of engineering your mountain bike really is. And by breaking down the parts of mountain bike tires, I hope you'll better be able to wade through the infinite number of options that are out there. Tune in next time to cover our cockpit and our saddle, which are the final two contact points on our bicycle. We already talked about our cranks, which is where our feet sit. And if you like watching these videos, please subscribe to our channel. We really like making them. Of course, if you have any questions for us, you can always let us know in the comments below or give us a call at 1-844-FANATIC. You can also bug Rich and Joseph by shooting them an email at sales at fanaticbike.com. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.